Welcome everyone to another episode of Wood from the Trees. Today I have Fiona Chung from Leitrim Village, believe it or not. <laughs> but that's that. Uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Fiona, thanks a million for coming. Thank you. Thanks Re- for having me. Really appreciate it. We were both stuck in the same traffic today going into Galway. It was ridiculous. chock a block. Yeah, we were just sending pictures of weird stuff we were seeing on the road. Yep. Hefford but, Road, guys. Anti-vaxxers. They, yeah, yeah, be careful there. <laughs> so I do this thing. I always ask people about their childhood and stuff and you have a really interesting story and I'm delighted you came on because you know I think it's important I don't have enough women on and you're literally other than my sister is the first woman here and and Vicky Vicky was here too but yeah but you know she's my wife she stuck to me anyway she's a woman uh, she is she is <laughs> but she's biased she's gonna like me anyway <laughs> fair enough fair enough <laughs> well um, anyway how did you end up where you are now okay so I would go back to your childhood We'll go back. Okay. Do you know what? We'll have to go back before my childhood. God, I love okay. stories like that. Once upon a time. Once upon a time when a man loved a woman <laughs> <laughs> in Hong Kong. So, um, mom and dad are from Hong Kong and they emigrated to Ireland in the 80s. Yeah. Now, this was when contraception was illegal in Ireland. This was when abortion. Uh, is abortion still illegal? Um, uh, in Ireland. In Ireland. Well, abortion at the time was, was legal anyway. So, yeah. Um, they actually thought that they were moving to the UK. Oh. They didn't realize. They didn't know they were going to Ireland. Ireland. Yeah, was a different place. Mom and dad, they moved over to Ireland. And um, like I said, contraception was illegal at the time and they Mm. didn't know. And uh, mom got pregnant with moi. (laughs) <laughs> and um, abortion was also illegal, so she was stuck with me. <laughs> she hardly wanted to abort you. Oh, that's it. Yeah, no, she that she did tell me this. Really? She told you this? Oh, yeah, she told me this when I was like in my teens. She was like, so the only reason why you're alive is because abortion was legal in Ireland. And I was like, oh, cheers, ma'am. That's that's a bombshell. <laughs> well, it's a truth bomb, so. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, and then, so anyways, they had me in Dublin. So they lived in Dublin for a while. And then they moved to uh, Leitrim, and they were in Carrick and Shannon. Then they moved to Sligo. What were they working at? So everyone, my whole family did the stereotypical thing where they opened up Chinese restaurants. It was the only way for them to make a living at that time. And like, it was a novelty for Irish people at that time. They were like, oh, all these Chinese places opening up. And everyone was like, oh, yeah, can I get the chicken chow mein and chicken curry and a three in one? Do you know? So um, my did, family did just people, gave the people what they wanted. And the people <laughs> in Hong Kong, was it, uh, how did they know there was an opportunity in Ireland um, to open restaurants? I think they just felt like there was an opportunity to move out of the country and then just do whatever you could to survive. Were and they at young? at that time... They were in their late 20s. They were young enough. Yeah, they were young enough. They must have had to save hard to get over here. They did save hard, but they also had like, you know, all the family would pool and put the money together to send one set over. Then, you know, the set that was over would be making a bit more money. Then they'd send that money back over to Hong Kong to Mm. send more family over abroad. So the family unit is tight. It should be. It should, should be. be. It should be. It should be. But it doesn't always work that way because when you mix, we'll say, finances, family, business, it, trying to integrate with different cultures, it gets very, very messy, especially when the family themselves could be suffering from mental health issues themselves and not realize it. Did they speak know? English when they came over? Very little. And even to this day, their English wouldn't be like impeccable we'll say really yeah strong uh, strong chinese accents <laughs> so did you move did you move open in different restaurants in different counties yeah. yeah that's that's how that's how it happened and that's how i ended up living in so many different counties around ireland because where did i last start off sligo yeah then we moved to balana county mayo so, so how long were you getting to stay in one place before you'd have to move um, so I was never in one house more than, we'll say, four years. And we the longest place I've ever lived in was Leitrim, and that was seven years growing up. So I had moved school quite a few times, about four times. Oh. Yeah. That must have been difficult. That was hard. That was really, really hard, it, especially in, we'll say, rural parts of Ireland. Because, like, not only is moving school hard, like, I was the only Asian kid in a lot of these schools. 
So I from the get go, people thought you were different. Oh, from the very beginning, I knew I was different. I knew I couldn't. I didn't have a chance of fitting in. Never had that chance. And, and that would you was know really that hard. when you'd be told we're moving again? Would it like all your friends? Would it break your heart? Oh, of course. And would because you say I, anything? Like, well, you didn't have a choice because your parents would just be like, we're doing this for you because we've had you and you're costing us loads of money and we have to make all of this money because Are you an you. only child? No, I have a younger sister, Emily. Yeah, I love her very much. So that yeah. was, that was, must have been really hard. Yeah, like me and her, we didn't, we have like, we have our issues because of how we were brought up. Like it, it really impacted us. Yeah, it was, it, how would I say it? There was, there was very little stability. So and would you have been each other's rocks? Because you wouldn't have had. No. You weren't. I wish we were. But because of the dynamics in the family, we were pitted against each other. Oh. Yeah, there was competition about like who was the better daughter, who was loved more. And like when I look back, I don't like to say that I have regrets in life, but the only regret that I would have is I wish I treated my sister better. Now she knows this, like we've, we're solid now, like we're solid mm. today. Um, and I'll always atone for like bad behavior that I did as a child. But again, like she says to me, like, we were kids. We didn't know. Mm. Oh, how could you? Yeah. How could we? Like we did, we did, we didn't know. And like, I would have been a jealous kid and I would, would have been very competitive because mom and dad were like wanting like a golden child. And so like, were they hard on you to be academically successful? They were hard on us in everything in life, like not just academically successful, but there was a huge weight on our appearance. So appearance, appearance. Yeah, because that is more valuable than intelligence in, in the family, because so in Asian is cultures, this, a, uh, this is a cultural thing. This would be a, a cultural thing, but also a dysfunctional thing within my own family. So I think like there is tones of it uh, in a cultural way. And then my family just emphasized it. So how did that manifest in your childhood? So um, I was, my nickname growing up by my parents, by my entire family was Faye Ona. And Faye in Cantonese means fat. What? So I was fat Ona. Yeah. And then like that would always be like, you know, being called fat piggy. I'd be given a bowl of rice and food and just be like, like, if I finished my food, I'd be told you're a fat fuck, like fat Ona at it again. Oh, look at her. She's pudgy. Who's the fat piggy in the house? Um, and, you know, things were said to me like, you'll you'll never find a husband because you're too fat and ugly. So as a child, as a child. Yeah. So I think my mom put me on my first diet when I was around 11, 12 years old. Because like you're a child, you're, you're growing up. So you're, you have, you're pudgy, yeah. but you're pudgy before you re reach adolescence for yeah, that yeah. growth spurt, you know? And my mother didn't have that knowledge or awareness. So she just saw me getting pudgy and then was like, no, you're too fat now. I'm going to put you on a diet. And like my dad was saying the same thing. And he would even get people like family, other family members or, um, not even family members, but people that the family knew to turn to tell me that I was fat. Wow. So, but look, I, I wear Fiona now, like as a badge of honor, because I'm just like, do you know what? Yeah, that was really tough. That was really, really hard. But if anyone else comes to insult me nowadays, I'm just like, I've had it worse. <laughs> <laughs> Come at me. <laughs> and did you live where you worked? Did you live over the restaurants or did you just... In parts, yeah. Sometimes there were moments in our... There were phases in our lives where we did have to do that. And I would say a Chinese restaurant is not a place to bring children up. Like, we were in... Did you have the, to work? Yes, I worked from the age of 12 in the kitchen. So, because mom and dad didn't want me to be seen at the front of the house because it'd be like, you can't have children working, you know. Mm. So, um, it would be scrubbing pots and pans, uh, you know, sort of we'll say cut peeling carrots, peeling potatoes. And that was when I was 12. Um, Every day? Most days, yeah. After, after school. school. Yeah, after school. And would they check your homework 
and stuff? No. So my I suffered academically um, because I was working so much. It like and I didn't realize that at the time and I didn't really actually learn English until I went to school, which was at the age of four. So my first few years were very tough. Um, now, I don't remember it that much because I was too, too young. But apparently I've been told that, yeah, I found maybe the first two years kind of tough trying to learn the language. Um, I didn't get support at home from homework per se because my parents wouldn't have really known no how to either. And all they knew was to work. So they're like, well, we'll get her to work anyways, you know, get her to do what we do. Um, but when I was about the age of 14, 15, that was when I started working at the front of the house, which would be serving food, um, taking phone calls, dealing with customer complaints, um, dealing with money, things like that. Yeah. When you moved that much, was it hard to have a social structure of friends and like yeah. a social life? Yeah, it was. I didn't have a social life. The only social life I had was in the restaurant with my family and then the staff in the restaurant. So what about boyfriends? Friends? I had friends like in school and, you know, I had boyfriends as well. Were they allowed to come over and chill? Yeah, they, they would have been like, if I wasn't working, I would have been able to hang out with them like outside of school or I would have been able to ha- like, we'll say, just stay around town, go in cinema or coming back to my house or at the restaurant. So they weren't saying to you, you have to be someone from your own culture? No. Now, that's an Asian thing. Yeah. Because like it's more prize to be with a white person, you know, really? it shows social status. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and, so, and, so they wanted to try and have you real pretty to pawn you off to some rich white person. Yes. Yes. That, that was the plan. That's like that's pretty much the plan. Now, they, you see, in Asian culture, your your intelligence isn't important. It's more how you look and if you can grab a man like with your appearance. So there is so much weight on that. Um, And women kind of believe that their role is only to, you know, find a man, have him provide for you so you can have kids and you can bring up those children. Like that's, that's the only. And are they arranging marriages or do you have to figure that out? Sometimes there are arranged marriages in Asia and I've seen it in not just, we'll say Hong Kong, but like in, in China Um, Even Southeast Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, like Philippines as well. There, it wouldn't be arranged per se like how the Indians do it, but there is some sort of of an arrangement going behind. You know, like make sure that the man has this sort of salary, Mm. you know, that he could provide for you. Um, You know, make sure that you know he's also good looking, so the kids you have are also going to be good looking. Were um, your mom and dad religious? Or did they have a religion? Yeah, they, they would have been religious in the wrong way. So um, mom would have been brought up Buddhist. Dad would have been Christian, except he floated around different religions. So, you know, he would have been, you know, the Catholic Church in Ireland. And then, you know, lo and behold, knock, knock, knock. We're here to talk about Jesus. We like <laughs> our brochures. And that was the Jehovah Witnesses. Yeah. And he became a Jehovah Witness for a while. Um, and we got roped into that. And then he, you know, he'd dance in and out of, of different religions trying to, I don't know, find something. Were they loving? My parents. Yeah. I think we would have de- different definitions of love. Did you get cuddles? No. no. Never. Uh, no, I, ah, uh, I was bullied in school and I went back home and I was crying and I was like explaining to mom and dad what was happening and <laughs> I got called weak. They were like, you're so weak. Oh, you disgust me. Like, and then I was like, yeah, but, I, but just what age want, I just want to hug. I think I was, I w- would have been in Carrick and Shannon. So I would have been between the ages of six and 10. And back then, that bullying, that would have been real bullying. So they would have been calling you what or what? (laughs) Ching Chong Chewy, Hong Kong Fooey. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't understand it at the time as well, because although in some ways you have some sort of a self-awareness that you're not going to be able to fit in because you look different, I wasn't exactly 
able to pinpoint why because the way I seen it I was just a child like everyone else mm. I was like we're all kind of the same I just have black like you it, didn't know any different because that was your life yeah exactly like for example you know with um with Caucasians you know you've got red hair brown hair mm. blonde hair I kind of thought that I was just one of ye but I just had black hair and blue like brown eyes yeah um, but as I was getting older, my mom was drilling it into me that I was different. You know, she was like, you're Chinese, you're Chinese, you're Chinese. People are treating you differently because you're Chinese. Um, and that kind of became her excuse and my father's excuse for certain behaviors or for why I couldn't do certain things in my life or why I should do certain things in my life. And what was their perception of Irish people? They had... Hmm... It's hard to say. They would have had... They were scared. They were scared. And I could understand why. Um, when we had restaurants, there was many times where, like, the windows were smashed in, things were stolen. And especially, we'll say, we encountered a lot of trouble from the traveling community as well, coming along, stealing things. So they were afraid. They were scared of, we'll say, white people, you know, Irish people at the time. And... It didn't help that sometimes suppliers were not always reliable or trying to charge more for their supplies and mm. kind of go taking advantage, taking advantage, going, oh, look, they don't their English isn't great or something or I'll pull the wool over their eyes. And it wasn't until I was a bit older that I could understand that, that things like that were happening. Now, I don't think my parents were able to pinpoint exactly when those moments were happening um, or were even aware of those. So it's just kind of some of the stuff just kind of went over their head. But I'm sure intuitively they knew that something wasn't right. So they were always very guarded and protected against, we we'll say, integrating with Irish culture. Um, and as you got older, listening to you speak, unless you've seen you, you you're <laughs> full blown Irish. <laughs> I know. That's the thing. Like a lot of people say to me, we forget you're actually Chinese until you talk on the phone to your parents and you speak Chinese. Can you speak fluent Chinese? I can speak fluent Cantonese. Not ma So there's two different types of Chinese. There's Mandarin and Cantonese and I can speak fluent Cantonese. Do you ever go back on holidays? Um, before COVID, yeah, I would have gone back because I still have family members mm. living over in Hong Kong. Do you um, love going to Hong Kong? No. Don't like it? It's very, very densely populated. And um, I think the Chinese culture is so driven by materialism, so driven by financial gain that they just treat people really poorly. Um, and I find that really difficult. It's, and they're so blunt over there. So if I go over and like I'm at a restaurant and say I want like my sweet and sour chicken or something, I'm ordering food. You know, she'll look like the waitress will come to me. She'll go, what do you want, fatty? You know, because over in Hong Kong, by Asian standards, I would be seen as a bigger build. Get away here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not joking. Like they are so, so thin because that is the prize. Like I've got cousins who are just like so much skinnier than I am. And I'm looking at them going, God, you need a ham sandwich. And that's their perception of beauty. <laughs> that is their perception of beauty. Yeah, it's to be thin it's to be white, um, tall, like they love the porcelain skin as well. Like they, you know how we got fake tan over here mm. and we rub it on our skins to make ourselves. They powder. Like that. They have laser surgery to um, make their skin look whiter. That goes back to ancient Chinese. Yes, history, it does. It? Yeah, because it's a symbol of wealth. It's mm. a, it says that you don't have to go out and work under the sun yeah. in the paddy fields. Yeah, yeah. That you, you know, that you're inside. So th on a hot day, you'd see loads of Asians with umbrellas they, like because they don't want to be in the sun. They love that white skin. Wow. Yeah. Like if I go over there, they'd be like, hi, darky. <laughs> you know, that, that's what I would call it. We call it dark. Um, like my family would say things to me before as well. <laughs> when I lived in Thailand, they're like, you don't look Chinese. You look like you're a Filipino or or a Thai person because you're so dark. Like, and it wasn't it wasn't in it, like in niceness. Wow. Yeah. But I loved it. Like I love the sun. So I was always out in the sun and I liked having a tan because I was like, well, this makes me look healthy, you know, because it's my natural, you know, Color. I'm naturally built for this. Mm. I don't want to look like a cancer patient, yeah, like, yeah. which is what they were aiming for. Skinny and white and pale. Like, why? There's 
So when you were getting older and you were having these little clashes with your parents, did you start disagreeing with them? Saying, like, did you start, when did you start saying, right, I, there's something up here. I think I want to go my own direction. Or were they trying to force you in certain directions or was there a clashing moment? There was definitely, there was always clashes because I'd never really understood where they were coming from. We were, it was very hard for us to be on the same page. Um, and I think the biggest defining moment was when I chose to do science in college. Like They had all these Chinese restaurants opened up and they wanted me to do catering and hospitality or Chinese in business. Like that was... Were they ordering you to do it? Like, this is what you have to do? This is, yeah, this is what we want you to do. You, This is going to guarantee a, a successful life. You're going to help us. And, and culturally, that's what you were supposed to do. And culturally, yeah, because it, like... We'll say in the Asian culture, they have kids because, well, most people have kids because they want to have a pension or they want to, like, it's for a financial gain that you'll be looked after when you're older. You, you, you don't have kids out of love. You have kids because you want a pension and there's financial gain behind it. Is it still like that? I think it's still like that. Yeah. A lot of people might not admit to that, but there that was... It's not why I'm here, but it's why a lot of um, people I know are here. Ancient cultures die hard. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. So yeah. what was the defining moment that kind of disagreed the most? Uh, well, it, there wouldn't have been a defining moment. It kind of happened incrementally. You know, I kind of went off, did college, did science on my own. Without their permission? Without their approval. Um, and then that meant that I had to financially put myself through college. So it didn't help you at all? Barely helped me. Dad would give me a little bit of money here and there every so often to help me out because I think he he felt bad in some way. But I also believe that they said that they weren't going to help me out because they didn't realize how stubborn I was actually going to be. They thought that it was going to get too hard for me and then I w wasn't going to continue on with science. And then I would do, we'll say, business or hospitality or catering. Did you go off on your own, like uh, moved to college? Oh, no. Yeah, I went. I went to Galway actually, GMIT. Uh, and from Cast uh, yeah. at the time, I would have been living in Ballina, County Mayo. Was that scary, on your own for the first time? No, I loved it because it meant freedom. It was. I didn't have to work in the restaurant every single day. I didn't have to like go to school, get off in town, go into the restaurant work behind the bar, then worry about my homework and do my homework under the counter or not even getting my homework done. So really that was the first time you started to figure out who you are? That, yeah, well, it was when I had the space to do that, yeah. That can go downhill for some people. That can, Yeah, and look, to be fair, I, had, I went downhill for many years before I was able to spiral back up. You mm. know, I had a lot of learning to do because I didn't... For my own family, I didn't get the opportunity to gain the skills, knowledge and resources to become a well-rounded human being. So when I left home, I was kind of a shell going, what what do I need to do to be like what? I didn't even know what a healthy relationship looked like. You know, I didn't know um, what was a healthy way to treat people or what was a healthy way to be treated. You know, um, it wasn't until, we'll say, in more recent years when I started doing therapy and and looking up, we'll say. When um, did you figure out there's something wrong here? I need to get therapy. Or I am. Everything's a mess. I always kind of knew growing up. You know, even in my teenage years, I knew something wasn't right. I just didn't know what was what it was. I, I always put it down to maybe it's just because I'm Chinese. It's just because I'm Chinese. That was that was all I was thinking. Oh, it's it's because I'm Chinese. That's why things are different. Well, it's things weird. just weren't working out for you. Or you just you weren't happy, or you I weren't finding enjoyment in stuff. Yeah, I wasn't happy. I was really hard on myself. You know, I could never be happy or at peace with where I was. You know, I had to be off doing something. I I always had to be doing. It was never enough to just be. You know, and I never thought that I was good enough. I always thought people hated me. I never thought that I was worthy of love. I never thought that I was worthy of any of, of like of any attention. So I would overgive to compensate, you know, um, in, in all relationships, all friends, relationships, friends, friends, romantic, 
interpersonal, professional, um, like within college, within within school, and like even within work. Um, it was it was hard, and I could never figure out why um, I felt the way I was feeling because I didn't trust my feelings. I didn't trust mm. my intuition. You know, there could be I could meet someone, and they might not be treating me very nice, and I would keep giving into that relationship thinking that they weren't being nice to me because, because it was enough. me because I wasn't giving enough or because I wasn't behaving in the right way and it took me a long time to realize that some people are just assholes yeah like yeah. elephants yeah <laughs> <laughs> pretty some much elephants are assholes yeah like that's and, and that's the way it was um but luckily when I you know started doing therapy and started looking into psychology because I was like okay what's what is going on with me? Yeah. I have to figure this out. And I treated, I did a lot of self-experimentation and I treated myself like a puzzle. You know, I took the ego away from it because the ego can get very triggering and you, you know, you can get really, really down on yourself and you're like, okay, I've had, I'm bored of being unhappy. I need to figure this out. And I just treated it as a puzzle. And as I started to uncover things, I was like, oh, um, I came across the term narcissistic abuse mm. I came across the term codependency and I started like diving into those and then I came across other terms like CPTSD um, and I also came across attachment styles which were absolutely fundamental into understanding my childhood and why I was the way I was and then it like helped me understand my parents as individuals and how their will say how their background impacted them and then conversely how that impacted me when I was growing up and I was like it was mind-blowing stuff uncovering all of that and like to also go oh because my parents had these narcissistic tendencies towards me um, when I was going into romantic relationships you always choose romantic relationships that are um, we'll say most familiar with where you come from, from mirroring, a parental... Mirroring your life. Yeah, from your parental background, mm. you know, so your partner will be s quite similar to your parents in that dynamic. And then I was like, oh, that's why I keep getting cheated on. And that's why, you know, par like partners treat me so terribly. Ah, oh, now I understand. Because, you know, I was finding that because it was familiar to me mm. because of how my parents had treated me. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it was absolutely fascinating. And then understanding all of that, I was able to do that U-turn and be like, okay, I choose new choices now. You are what you think. It's all about your perception. Yeah. yeah. And I would say the biggest thing that freed me the most was understanding the concept that someone's reaction to you is a reflection on them. And your response to that reaction is a reflection on you. Yeah, exactly. It's like how people act, how people think, how people feel. It's always about them. It's never about you. Mm -hmm. So when I understood that, I was like, okay, take nothing personally and take your ego out of the equation and life would be just, you'd just be so much happier in life. It's, it's all about personal responsibility. Yes. When you break down everything, mm -hmm. personal responsibility is the only thing that's going to take anyone anywhere. Yes, Absolutely. Like, I just, I, I love personal responsibility. Like, and I would have learned that when I started looking at Jordan B. Peterson stuff, mm. was we'll say in 2000, as early as 2015, 16, that was when I was getting into his stuff. And I think that was a really big, pivotal moment for me because he was actually able to give practical advice on how you can change in your daily life things that you can do in your daily life to become a better person or to understand things. And that was like cutting away toxic relationships, taking personal responsibility, looking inward. And um, as a woman, isn't it mind blowing how he can be labeled as a misogynist? Yes. And I think he's labeled as a misogynist because people don't dive deep enough. No, they take small out. little snippets. Yes. And they label him as something that he's not. Yes. Yeah. Right on point. Like, 
if you were actually to sit down and listen to an hour lecture or an hour and a half, yeah. you would understand that he has a very positive message for both men mm. and women. Not just that, you know, that he's like, oh, men should be doing this. but Just people take the narrative and run with it. And well, it's, it's a shallow thing because mm. people take snippets because they don't have, they don't give it the time. You know, they just hear what they want to hear. Oh, he's terrible. And I also do believe that a lot of people probably are not ready to hear some of the things that he has to say at that, you know, maybe in their um, moment in their life. Because what he has to say can strip you raw if you really listen to it and go, whoa, you know, everything that's wrong with me is my own fault. And, and it isn't crazy. And if anyone just sits and just thinks about it, it just it hits you like a freight train. If you really ask, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. The the real, the, the things come so quick to you. Yeah. Yeah. Like what stupid shit am I doing to make my life more hard? Yeah. And what little things <laughs> could I stop? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's pretty much. And I just, I had like, I just turned my life around and said, you know, this is not working for me. What were the first things that you noticed you were doing? Um, that you stopped? Well, first of all, I stopped being a victim. That was the biggest thing. I used to be like, oh, people are racist. People are horrible to me because I'm Chinese. And I realized that that was installed into my programming because of my parents, because those were the messages that they were feeding me, that I was oppressed, that people are going to be mean to me, um, that the world is this big, dangerous place. And, you know, that takes personal responsibility because there, it's... It's very tempting to say it's someone else's fault yes. than to say it's your own fault. And the world is a dangerous place. And there is nasty people out there. But that's the world. That and you the... have to choose that you're going to go through it the best way you can. Exactly. So it always goes back to personal responsibility. It does. And it's, it's, when you can take personal responsibility for yourself, it's so empowering because you take back complete control of your life. If I say it's your fault, that means oh, I can't do anything about it because it's someone else's fault. Mm. But if I say it's my fault, I can go, I can actually do something about that. I can turn my life around. I can make the better decision. I can atone for bad behavior or I can go in a different direction that is way more healthy. And like I, do, I find with young people now, especially in college, I don't know, I didn't go to college, but most people that are in college, I think they're learning so much about the bad things that are in the world and all the negative people and all the things that are wrong, which there is, mm -hmm. but they're not being shown, you know, it's your job to fix these things. Like you have yes. to fix this. Yeah. It's not someone else. You don't shout and scream and say, you're the problem, you're the problem. Mm -hmm. We're all the problem. Yeah. yeah. You know, we, all we can do is change ourselves and yeah. push forward. It's like those SJWs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm unhappy, so I'm going to like go outside and protest. And yeah. here, here's my placard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I just, I was never, I was never into that crowd because I, I, again, I didn't understand it, and I was too busy like hating myself to be like this is anyone else's fault. Totally all Did my. Did you fault. hate yourself? Yes, absolutely. I hated myself from. Well, I was brought up to hate myself because I was never good enough. Did you ever go back to your mom and dad and say? they done that or they like did you ever talk have, to him about it? have yes. a conversation yeah i tried and um they and i've like spoke in therapy about you know how i could manage this or something like that and the conclusion was that they don't have the capacity enough capacity for empathy to be able to meet me there do you talk to him now um I would talk to them, but we are estranged. So it's just sometimes when you have to put certain boundaries in your life to protect yourself, it does mean estrangement. And Do you miss them? Um, yes and no. Yes, I miss them in that I hope that they're doing okay. I hope that they're well. And I do know where they are and I have spoken to them and they are okay and they are well. So that's grand. But no, because they can be very narcissistic and very codependent and it takes a lot of energy out of me to entertain them you know I have like it means doing a lot of work for them when I'm around them when I was younger 
I remember we would get bills in the post and I would have only been about 10 from the age of 10 and like my dad getting me to read the bills and tell him how much this bill was or how much that bill was and then being worried about finances as a kid because of his reaction when he was listening to those figures and And as a parent you really try and hide all that stuff from your kids so they can have a childhood yeah no I didn't have a childhood I was parentified from a very very young age because I had to look after my sister as well um and there was a lot of responsibilities within the restaurant that were given to me at a very young age too that I had to like I worked from from a very young age work was work came before school and there was you know I was always late into school because I had to rely on my parents bringing me into school as well and they would get up late because they were tired from working the night before and then you know sometimes they wouldn't have my homework done because they didn't have anyone to help me with my homework like this okay so this is a story this is a funny one my parents brought me to school on a bank holiday Monday <laughs> and they didn't realize that it was a bank holiday Monday and because they usually bring me to school late there's never usually anyone outside anyway so you didn't know so I didn't know so you know got out of the car and I went like to like to the back of the school with the, with the doors open, and everything was locked and then I was like oh, there's no one here and by myself and I did not know what to do I fucking freaked out I was like what am I going to do I'm by myself there's no teacher no there's phones. no kids nothing no phones and um, so all I did was I went to the front of the school and I just sat on the steps all day no not all day um, there was a man a stranger <laughs> no. and he yeah well nowadays you think that but he came up to me and he goes what's what's your name and obviously I was crying and stuff and he's like you know there's no school today it's a bank holiday Monday and you know I was like <laughs> snot dripping down my nose <laughs> tears running down my face shoulders going and um he was like well do you want to tell me do you know where you live and I'll take you home I'll walk you home and uh I was like yeah I know where I live and uh, he was like, well, okay, let's let's walk you home. And he, he walked me home, uh. knocked on the door, you know, and it was my mom that opened the door and my like they were just really confused, like, what what has she done? Or like, mm. what's going on? And then he kind of like explained that to him and then, you know, that was that was the end of that. But it was like I wish I, I was old enough that I could thank him. Yeah. And appreciate that. And I would like I look back on moments in my life and realize how lucky I was because that could have turned turned around and been terrible. Oh yeah, for sure. Everyone has them every day. Yeah. Did you celebrate enough. Christmas? No. So Christmas was taken away from us when I was six years old because Dad became a Jehovah Witness, and they turned. But you'd around. celebrated it before then. Well, we had a little bit of it. Like you know, I do remember that there was a Christmas tree, and I do remember that there were, um, that relatives would give presents as well. And that it was a thing in school. And when I was six, dad told me that there was no Christmas, that there was no such thing as Santa Claus and not to tell anybody else um, that it was our little secret that I knew. Uh, don't be telling the kids in school. Um, and don't tell mom that I knew that Santa Claus wasn't real. So that was the end of Christmas at the age of six. I was very jealous in school. Very, very jealous that... All these kids had Santa Claus. Yeah. Six. Wow. Yeah. That's mad. Yeah. Yeah. And your your little sister. Yes. So you felt like a, you were like a mammy to her. I I had to be in moments. Yeah. Were um, you loving to her? Not always, because like I said, we were pitted against each other as well. There was competition for our parents' love. You know, our parents would pit each other against us like, oh, Fiona's like, you know, the good girl and she's done this and she's, um, you know, she's the smarter one. But Emily, you're the more beautiful one because you're you're skinnier and you're going to find a nice husband. And, you know, you're the one that's wanted because obviously I was the accident and I couldn't be aborted. So. And they'd say that. Yes. Yeah. So my my mom, when I was uh, a teenager, turned around to me and was like, yeah, I got pregnant with you because contraception was illegal in Ireland. And um, then when I found out I was pregnant with you, I couldn't abort you because abortion was illegal in Ireland. And that's why you're here. And she was like, you be-. she turned around to me as well at one point in my life where she's like, you ruined my life because I never wanted to have kids. 
and I'm stuck with you. So you're responsible for making things better. Did your mom ever tell you she loved you? Um, no, actually, neither. Or your dad? No, they don't know how. They're. I think they get awkward when they even talk about the word love. You know, they get awkward. They can't really actually turn around and say "I love you" or in Cantonese "O oile." You know, they don't. They don't. I don't remember having those words being said to me. I tell my sister though, because I want her to know that she's loved. You're quiet now. That's, <laughs> uh, that's um, that's mind blowing for for me. Is it? Yeah. Why? God, I think uh, as a child, all you want is to feel safe and loved. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think you'd agree with that, wouldn't you? It's, yeah. it's it's kind of all you try and do. Yeah. That actually makes me really sad. Oh, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I didn't mean to make you sad. No, no, but no. it's just, it's crazy. Like when uh, with my kids, I always want to make them feel loved. Like, yeah. And my parents, I always felt loved and my brothers and sisters. and Yeah. That's like, tough. It is tough. Like, like I said, we've got different definitions of love. They loved me in their own way. They loved me. Their love was transactional. It was via money. Make, you know, the more money I make means the more I love my family Mm. so I suppose in that way that was how they showed that they they loved me you know and putting a a roof over my head I suppose at times and um you know putting pressure on me to behave in a certain way or to try achieve things in life I suppose that was their expression of love like trying to protect me from this big bad dangerous world as well by telling me not to do things like I secretly wanted to be a doctor Mm. when I was a kid right and my mom turned around to me and she's like you're never going to be smart enough to be a doctor you're going to end up killing people so then I was like okay not going to be a doctor but that was my mother's way of saying um protecting me you know and maybe that was her her way to express love the, the love that was expressed is not one that's nurturing or caring or embracing. Were your mother and father loving towards each other? No. No. More of a business relationship? It was more of a codependent relationship, I would say. Um, being more afraid of loneliness. Um, being afraid of what society might think of a single individual because for some reason if you're single in asia it's like this big taboo thing you know it's you shouldn't be single after the age of in your 20s otherwise you're seen as like you know what's wrong with you why doesn't anyone want you you must be garbage what's wrong with you so irish (laughs) (laughs) yeah it must be really weird for you because you're looking at me and i've got this asian face and then the words that are coming out of my mouth. When are I was all talking like to you on the phone, Irish accents. You, you, you sounded the very same as my cousin. I was there thinking, why is, why is my cousin ringing me? And then <laughs> it was you. Yeah. But when you were in, when you're in college. Yes. So you're you're studying real hard at biology. Um, I did biopharmaceutical. Biopharmaceutical. Yeah. So you're studying real hard for that, mm-hmm. but you're also studying hard on yourself. Is that at the same time happening? You're you're going to. Yeah, I was. I was. I wouldn't have been studying as hard on myself because at the time when I went to college, I was like, freedom. Party. Oh, yes. <laughs> a lot. Like just getting drunk and then having fun with friends and just like, I have to say, I made some really, really good friendships in college. Was that the first time you could really, really make friends? No. Um, I was always able to make friends because I like people. You know, I enjoy people. I enjoy people's company and... um. But I would say my, the closest friend I have would be Lucy Butler. She's class. Shout out to Lucy. Oh yeah, shout out to Lucy (laughs) Butler and her husband, Cormac Flynn. (laughs) But she would be, she would have been my closest friend. So I've known her since I was 15. And she was able to recognize before me that things were not right in my family. And, you know, the other time she'd be like, you know, that's a bit weird. And I'd be like, well, oh, but, you know, it's because I'm Chinese. You know, we, we treat each other like that. It's fine. And she'd be like, 
uh, okay, but that's a bit weird. You know, why are you always working? You're in school. You should be doing homework. <laughs> you know, shit like that. And, um, but she always remained close by. Yeah. And she always took care of me. She, I got, I became homeless. What? <laughs> yeah. For just a very, very short period, right? I had like this mental breakdown and, you know, I. In college? No. So this would have been like two years ago. And I try to go back to my parents and she had said to me, I don't think it's a good idea that you go back to your parents because, you know, they might, things might go a bit cuckoo for you. And uh, I didn't listen and I should have listened because I did go back to my parents and I went even more cuckoo. Did they say I told you so? Who, Lucy? No, you're, when you went back to your parents, were they like, now look, you no. should have done what we said. No, no, um, it was, it was, my mother called me disgusting. And then the, I took that really hard. And so I was like, okay. And then Lucy was like, okay, you should really come and, you know, come to mind. So then Lucy and Cormac actually had me in their house for a few weeks while I was trying to get my shit together. How did you end up homeless? Um, well, I ended up homeless twice. And it would have been, the first time would have been in the UK. And that was because uh, was it was the breakdown of a romantic relationship I had at the time. Again, like I said, you mimic relationships that you had with your parents. And um, I decided to leave that relationship. And leaving that relationship, I have to say, was the best decision I've ever made in my life. Because it took me down this massive journey of like, what is wrong with me? Like, there is there is this repeated pattern. But um, I had nowhere to go because I was living with that person at the time. So Are you working out in England? Um, I was, I went out over to the UK to financially support my part, like at that time, an ex-partner, they wanted to go back to college to do the PGC. So I was like, okay, uh, I'll, we'll move over, you study, I'll help financially support. And then when you get a job as a teacher, you'll financially support me while I go back and do my studies. But then when it came to my turn to do my studies... Um, it didn't happen. The relationship broke down and I was, yeah, like I was in the house for a few months, but it's not easy living with an ex. No, I can imagine. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> things can get very awkward very quick. And, um, but like, I'm glad I, I'm glad I did it. Um, and eventually I just had enough of it. And I think being homeless at the time was better than being in under that roof. It must've been bad. So. Yes, bad, like just bad for, f psychologically it was bad. Is um, that your lowest that you've been? Yes, that would have been the lowest I'd been. And I ended up um, moving in to, we'll say the sugar daddy scene because I had no other way of making money at the time because I had gone back to college then and I was too stubborn to move out. And I was like, I'm just going to do whatever I can to make ends meet. And I was still sending money home as well to my family was that a given you had to do that I've always had to give money to my family like as soon as I got as soon as I finished college and I had got a job there was a requirement that you would give your family money who, who sets the amount your parents would just be like give me this give me that you know and you, you'd tell them how much you were earning and they'd say we yes. want this much yeah pretty much yeah and you yeah. live on the rest yes or and you'd be made feel guilty if you couldn't give money to your to your family because they'd be like, We raised you, we gave you money, we put you through this, that and the other. We had to put a roof over your head, we had to make sacrifices. So you were put under tremendous pressure to give back to your parents for the burden that you caused them. And it was yeah, it that was like that was tough because none of my friends had to do that. And it was like their parents were throwing money at them and I was like oh, why can't I have Irish parents yeah. <laughs> kind of a way um but like two years ago I decided to stop giving my family any money because I told them what I had done to get money um and that was like we'll say the sugar daddy scene and stuff like that and yeah I told forgive me and not no no but what is a sugar daddy scene <laughs> so a sugar daddy scene it's it's not like prostitution, but it's kind of like an escort service. 
and you know they'd be older men looking for the company of women and sometimes you know in some of these relationships there there could be there could be sexual activities make someone like feel good about themselves and like sometimes it was just going for dinner mm. with these old lonely men lonely men who wanted company and wanted to have a conversation with someone now that's not to say that like they would make advances and expect you to return um those Did your advances. mom and dad know this um i i ended up telling them and that was when my mother said that i was disgusting that was hard Yes, it really did hurt. When, when you told her that you were kind of looking for help or, you know, this is how bad a situation I'm in. Yeah, well, I basically said, this is what I did to get you guys money. And That's, was that mostly to make sure that they got money? It was It was mostly to make sure that, yeah, they had money. Because they had come over to visit me in the UK. And, like, I was put under pressure to put them up in a nice hotel and put my sister up in a nice hotel and... I had said to them, when you, every time you came over and you put up in these four-star hotels, that was how I got the money to do that. That's yeah. pressure. It's, it is, yeah, yeah. Look, I don't, I don't regret a single thing I've done because it's gotten me to where I am today. And I'm so grateful for where I am today because you could look at these experiences and think that they're all negative and that I have been oppressed and that I am this victim of life. But we put... We put um, it on experiences, whether it's good or bad. Mm. But experiences at the end of the day are just experiences. And you can look at it with... Like, and there's struggles that make you psychologically stronger. Exactly. So, like, if, it wa- if I hadn't had those experiences, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I don't judge those experiences as negative because I've always learned from them. You know, like, I talked to a lot of lonely men and was like, wow, that's such a big life regret that they've had. That's a regret that I don't ever want to have, you know? Um, Or sort of being able to see that even if you had money, like there was one guy, he made like 600,000 a month, Mm. 600,000 a month. And it was just, money was no object to him, but yet he was still lonely. And I could see sadness behind his eyes every time, like I talked to him. And I was thinking, wow, like, I have not money. Money means not as a human, you're a sentient being. Yes. And there's a few things that you need, you know, air, food, water, but you need communication. You need someone to love you. Yeah. You need friends. You need, you need family. Like you don't need all those things. But if you don't have at least four of them, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not a well-rounded person. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. I think we can really lose sight of what's important in life. Mm. And for me, I learned from that sugar daddy experience that money is absolutely nothing. And I was like, I don't, I, why do people put such a lot of weight on financial gain? Like, well, like I never really had that where I wanted, like where I was greedy for money. I wanted money because my parents wanted money and I was giving to my parents. But for myself, Whenever I had it, I wanted to spend it on other people. And I'm still like that today because I love buying presents. I love making other people happy. I love like gift giving. It's my love language. And, you know, and I it doesn't really matter still, how much. Is that still down to that need to please? It used to be, but now I, I've worked so, on a lot of deep inner work. And now it's just purely like pleasure, like just indulgence. Like I love giving no matter what it is. Um, so we'll say for work, I love volunteering. I really enjoy volunteering. And I think it's because when you can empathize with people who've been in similar life situations as yourself, because of all the experiences you've been in, you don't want another person to feel like the way you did, you know, so you're going to do whatever you can to make sure that that person can have a good experience, you know, and like I never wanted my sister to feel like the way I did, you know, growing up. And I don't want her to feel bad about herself. I don't want her to feel, um, to have low confidence. So, you know, what I do is I, you know, I give her a call. I chat with her. I see how she's doing. I encourage her to, to do things. I tell her I love her. I tell her I think she's amazing um, because I want her to feel that, you know. Is she still at home? No, she um she lives in Clare. She lives in Clare. Yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, what does she work at? Uh, she's actually gone back to, to college. Yeah, she, <laughs> it's so funny because I'm an engineer, right? And I gave her so <laughs> much grief about doing engineering. And now I'm an engineer. Um, you love your job? I love my job. What I is your really, job? I really, really love my job. I'm a validation engineer. Um, and that mean, what that means is I go into different manufacturing companies and they're mostly pharmaceutical companies. And I make sure that their equipment, their processes, their facilities work as they intend to and that they meet regulatory requirements. But I absolutely love my job. Like I get such a kick out of my job because it means I'm on the road a lot. So I get to meet new people all the time. I get to meet different personalities, which is always very interesting because mm. when you're mi mixing with personalities. Yeah. Um, but also at work, they really give me a lot of freedom to do extracurricular activities. So at the moment, I go into a primary school in uh, Sligo every Friday and like I do this STEM program called Engineering in a Box. And I basically tell kids how cool engineering is and we like do all these activities. So last Friday we made paper airplanes and we made boats and I was talking about the Archimedes principle, like the engineering principle of, and um, talking about how planes stay in the air. And like the week before, no, two weeks before that, for the Easter break, you know, we made windmills and we talked about propellers. So like, I love going into a classroom because I love kids. Like mm -hmm. I, I used to do teaching. I had lived in Thailand for, for three years. And um, I you've had, been around. <laughs> I know, yeah, I really have been around. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's all it's all a life experience though. I say yes to as many opportunities as I can in life. To gain as many experiences as I can. Why do you think there's not as much women in STEM fields? Um, I actually really like what Jordan B. Peterson th says about that. Um, it's because women are more interested in people, people than things. Than things, and that makes sense from an evolutionary perspective mm. because women had to be at home. Women were in a community. Women have to bear infants. Women have to take care of each other. So. You know, we, our survival was connected with, through interacting with others within a community, interacting with other people, making sure the needs of other people were met. And, and your, your, your brain is better wired for it. Absolutely. That's why we're higher in agreeableness. Yeah. It's like when I come home and I'm talking to Vicky and she's telling me about her day, she, a story that I could have told in three minutes will take about an hour. <laughs> yeah you know women actually um i read this study where women actually have to reach a certain number of words per day before they go to sleep i, I before, heard that as well yeah. before they yeah, actually yeah, feel yeah. comfortable yeah. yeah and i totally resonate with that because oh i love talking shite i could talk shite all day long like this is exactly why i'm here talking shite you know i just got to use up my work work count for the day <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sleep early tonight, though. yeah exactly <laughs> what is your definition of happiness in five years, if I was to say you could have the life you want, what is the life you'd have? I have the life that I want already. I have it today. That's cool. Yeah, I I want for nothing. I am so grateful for everything that I have. So how do you set goals and targets for extra stuff that you want? Um, again, it's all about self-experimentation. I'm kind of like, I wonder if I could push myself. I wonder if I could do this. I wonder how far I could go. And some of the wants I recognize are all just sort of like ego wants, you know, like I want a promotion and work because it's, it's like, it's nice to the ego mm. and you feel good and whatnot. But if I was to really sit down and say, what do I actually want? There is nothing that I actually want because I have everything I need already. I have fantastic relationships with people that I care about. I have people that care about me. I have my own definition of family. Um, what is your definition of family? My, <laughs> my definition of family, it would be people who are there for you, people who respect your boundaries, people who are, you know, people who actually see you. They can validate your feelings. They're not there to make you feel bad. You know, they don't actually want anything from you but your presence. Do you have kids? No. Would you like to have them? Um, I th I'm afraid of having kids. That's the honest truth. I th I think I would love to have kids. Yes. 
um there was a very long time in my life where I was like I don't want to have kids I don't want to have kids I don't want to have kids I'm not going to have kids because I thought I would be a terrible mother you know that was drilled into me that I would be a horrible mother now it you know you wouldn't now I know now I know I wouldn't but there are still certain things in my life where I feel like I think I need to get a better grip on this before I can teach someone else this life lesson if you know what I mean like I am very aware what it's like if you're if you're a bad parent you know um I'm the consequences of of bad parenting and I know I've said like I want for nothing but you were saying before (coughs) it's ironic that you're parents bad parenting got you where you are yes but i'm that's happened to me not everyone gets out like this you know there's a lot of people who who do stay homeless who do end up having really poor boundaries with other people who do struggle with addiction um you know suicide as well is a consequence of not be of you know having a terrible childhood and not being able to understand that and like I've seen that I've seen I've seen the bad side of stuff you know I've been to very very dark places and the reason why I say I want for nothing is because I got out the other side intact not everyone does and you know you are lucky to <coughs> do that exactly and there's a lot of people who don't even have the self awareness of you know that they're actually stuck in a rut because they can't go back into their childhood to to unpack everything that's happened. And do you know many people in your community? And would you think, God, I wonder they suffering the same things I did? Or is it just you stick to your own little thing and I when I when I've talked to a lot of other Asian people um, and people who are not related to me but had a very similar upbringing, you always see it in the eyes. There is a knowing. You struggle the same way I did. And sometimes there is, I have this awareness where I'm like, they're not where I am yet. They could get to where I am. They could be free, but they don't see that. And do men in the Asian community have the same problem? Or is it... Uh female thing more so i think no i don't think it's gender specific i think it's both men and women i think the asian culture is really messed up like there's a lot to unpack there if you think about communism and everything is has to be together we have to share everything there's no sense of individuality and if you were to become an individual you're made feel guilty for that you're made feel you're guilty. An outcast for yeah you're an outcast you're made feel guilty for making your own life choices so when you look at what's going on over in hong kong with the riots and stuff and yeah yeah that's all scary be- isn't it it is very scary and for you to knows that side inside out and mm-hmm. when you see what's sneaking in here little yes. little by little yes people don't know what they're getting into do they no and they also don't know how good they have it no you know, they don't, they really don't know. Like I've, we'll say in my workspace and I've spoken to women throughout my life and they'd be like, oh, men are pricks and oh, we're oppressed and I'm a feminist because of this and that and the other. And, you know, I look over at them and I just think, you have no idea how much freedom you have. You have no idea how lucky you are to be in this Western side of the world. You know, like in Thailand, there is no such thing as domestic rape. A husband can rape his wife as much as he wanted and nobody can help her. She could call the police and the police would be like, well, you belong to that man. Belong? Oh, yeah. You belong to that man. You're his wife. Property. Women are seen as property. like, And that's what I mean. Women do not realize how good they have it here. There's so much freedom. Like, if a man even just looked at me inappropriately here and all I had to do is go to HR and say it, HR would be up in a fuss. And I'd be protected and I'd be looked after and I'd be told, are you okay? But, you know, over in parts of Asia, a man can hit a woman and it'll be okay. A man can rape a woman and it'll be okay. Like there, there's no protection. Now, unless that woman was not married to the man, right? And she belonged to a family and he, he raped her, right? That family can go and like fight that man. And go the to the same place. as if someone hit my car. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
And in parts of China too, in rural China, it's like that too. Women are seen more as possessions or we'll say a brooding mechanism, you know, a mechanism to have kids, a mechanism for the continuation of the species, if you want to say it that way. And that's why it's so important that we have to look attractive because to look attractive means you can get the better quality man. Wow. It's mind blowing. Yeah, I'm telling you. I like, I'm, I, it, this stuff fascinates me. It does fascinate me. And it's probably, again, why I'm able to be so grateful for where I am in life because I know how much worse it could be. Do you, do you love Leitrim? I absolutely love Leitrim. What made you fall in love with Leitrim? Leitrim, um, I had, there is a sentimental value in Leitrim. So it, I would have had really happy times as a child in Leitrim. And that's why I go back there. And is that your forever home? It could be. I don't know. Like, I've moved around a lot. I've, you know, I've lived in Asia, <laughs> mm-hmm. lived in the UK, lived all around Ireland. Um, I don't know what life is going to throw at me. And I'm always going to say yes to different opportunities and yes to different life experiences. I never want to be stagnant and I never want to pigeonhole myself into one area of life, you know, so... I, I want to get as many experiences as I, as I can in this one lifetime. Well, I suppose that's what you're supposed You're young, so you're supposed to be doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I'm I'm 32. Yeah, you're young. Yeah, so, yeah, I still have a few decades. Unless the clock starts ticking and you go, oh, no, you wake up tomorrow <laughs> and I want to have 10 kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I'll have 10 kids, but I tell you what, I would, I think it would be nice to have kids, but... Well, I'll give you a bit of advice. There's never a right time. And if yeah, <laughs> that's fair enough. If yeah. you're looking for a right time, nobody, there yeah. is no right time for kids. Yeah, it's I can just, imagine. It's just something that you do and you roll with. For me anyway, I was never ready for it. You just do it. Maybe it's easier for a man to be ready than for a woman. I don't know. I, I've never had the experience as a woman. Yeah. I know that when Vicky first told me she was having a baby, I was shitting myself. Because yeah. I my life was a mess at the time. I yeah. knew I wasn't ready for it. Yeah. And then it happens. And your job as a manager, oh, I have to provide, I have to feed, and you need money coming in. Mm-hmm. And But the, the minute Vicky had it, she, she, I, she just knew exactly what to do. And she, uh, women are amazing. The minute they come out, they yeah. just have these things that they can do and they're connected to them. And you're just sitting there going, oh God, it's crying all the time. I'm afraid <laughs> I'm going to break it. And, <laughs> But yeah. it's only when you can communicate and have conversations with and make eye contact. It takes, yeah. what was it, three or four months before they actually are like looking at you and they know you. Yeah. But for women, they, they're so connected. Yeah. Like it's amazing. You'd nearly be jealous when they come out because the baby just want them. You hold the baby, it cries, you give it to the mammy and you just know. Yeah. Well... That's because they grew inside the mammy. Mm. So all the cells that have grown from them have come from the mammy. Exactly. You yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. They're, they're like physically connected. Yeah. It's, great. it's amazing, really. Yeah, no, I think it's very cool. I would I would have loved to have a better relationship with my mother. I would have loved to have that connection. I really uh, they would. They must be proud of you now. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. They've never said they were proud of me either. So I don't know. Very forthcoming with like um, criticism, we'll say, yeah. and not so much with like what you're doing right. But I think that could be just an Asian thing as well, or just, I don't know, a way of expressing their love. Because the way they express their love always came from a fear, fear-based fear emotion. Don't do that. Don't do this. You know, um, rather than a place of love. Where you're, where it's like you, you feel like that swelling in your chest, your heart is expanding, and you're like, oh, you're amazing, you're great, um, I'm so proud of you, you've done these amazing things. So, you know, when I was a teacher, and even like when I'm in the classroom now, volunteering with kids, I always make it a point to compliment kids, to tell them that they've done a good job in something, and it's not like fake compliments or throwaway things. Mm. I genuinely look for something that they've done. And compliment them on that. And be like, and it's not like something superficial about how they've looked. It's always to do with their behavior or their ability. Oh, so, yeah. 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 You have to, I think with kids, with everyone, you have to water the parts that you want to grow. Yes. 
because they're, they're the things that'll actually make their life easy that it's coming to them easy and they understand yeah. you know, oh, all right this is I'm, I'm doing this right yeah 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 you if you have this blanket thing where you're telling everyone oh you're brilliant and when you're not it can be very confusing couldn't it yeah exactly yeah yeah no i there's also something that i really enjoy about children is how they see the world i know they're so playful yeah everything everything's new Every, yes everything is new and you can even see it in their eyes when they experience things it's like when i'm in the classroom and i'm doing these projects with the kids they're like wow and then they're like yes and you know they have this enthusiasm that i think adults lose because we're like oh we got to be professional and, and we, we think we know do, everything and we think we know everything and we we have to behave in a certain way mm. because we can't be seen as playful people like you know there's another thing that really grills me is you know, when people say to me, you can't give me parenting advice because you're not a parent yourself. You know nothing, you know? And I'm like, yeah, but I was a it's child It's more human once. advice. It's but, advice, you know, when you see things with kids. Yeah, but not even that, but I was a child once, hmm. you know? And so were you. Like, somewhere deep down in, within you, there is still that child and you knew what you liked and what you didn't like and how you wanted to be treated. All you have to do is just go back into that space of, you know, your inner child and, and remember that and realize, oh, this is how I want to be treated. And this is, you know, I don't like it when I'm given off to in this way. Mm. You just know you have to I suppose it's, it's a you have to. How would I say it? Strengthen your empathy muscle. Yeah. That's that's it. Like, and it's so sad when people lose lose parts of their inner child, because it's what keeps or even them just finding life exciting. When you yes. when you watch it, I was watching Jane the other day. She was outside in a little puddle, and she was just kneel, kneeling down at the puddle, and she was just tapping her finger in it, and <laughs> the, the ripples were coming out. And she was just getting so excited. She was just. <gasps> Yeah. And I was looking at it and go, God, I wish something so small <laughs> would yeah. make me that excited. Could you imagine yeah. if you got that excited over? You still could, though. Well, you do, but you have to find it. But everyone is so caught up in a. Yeah. It's hard to find that. It is. It is. No, yeah. I still do, especially when I'm hanging out with the kids. And I, because I know I was parentified very young and I didn't have a childhood, nowadays I would take some time out to be a child just to like do things that I enjoy and have that playfulness about it. What do you do? What are your things? Your childish things? My childish things. I love blowing bubbles in the bath. Blow them, like sticking your head in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Loads of bubbles. Yeah, pretty much. I just blow bubbles in the bath. And, or you can, you, if you have a straw, you bring a straw in the bath and you blow the bubbles. And, you know, sometimes I try to try blow the biggest, make the biggest bubble as well. Like I, I do that too. Or, you know, I love playing board games. Love board games. Love spending time doing those. Oh, yeah. you need to get a PlayStation. That's a game. Oh, uh, well, no, I, I was I was into Xbox. Xbox? Yes. No, no, Xbox. no, no Xbox I was a me. big Halo fan when I was... Oh, Halo's a good game. Yeah, it is a good game. That is a good game. Yeah, it is so a you're a bit of a gamer as well. I used to be, not as much anymore. I played a little bit of Overwatch as well when I was in the UK. Um, Never heard of that. That was a PC game. Again, it's just like, you know, first person shoot, shooter. I, I like I wanted violent shooting, <laughs> killing, you know, that kind of that kind of a way. Do you ever go shooting in real life? No, no, no. Clay no. pigeon shooting is great crack. I've never well actually they're outside Leitro and there is a place that does there is. Play, yeah. yeah. I should give it a go. Sure, it's really good fun. Is it? Really I'd probably good fun. end up shooting a bird though. No, you would. <laughs> you would. You never know, you might like that. Oh, that's true. That is true. Yeah. Do I you, know. Do you eat birds? What do you mean, do I eat birds? Yeah, yeah chicken. chicken. Yeah, I'm, yeah, just, chicken. I'm just wondering. There's a lot of people. I had a um, guy come over to me the other day yeah. right, in the film station. And he said, um, you know, I, I want you to promote this thing, a GoFundMe thing I'm doing. And and I was like, all right, no bother. I'm doing a darkness to light cycle in whatever time. I says, yeah, yeah, no bother. He says, look, I don't follow you anymore. I used to. Just when I seen you kill that fox, I, I just couldn't follow you anymore. And I was like, well, sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> He goes, just we're vegans at home. And I was like, well, I didn't, I didn't eat the fox. Like, you know, it killed yeah. chickens. We shot it. Uh, big deal. Yeah. But um, he got fierce upset. He was so upset over the fox being killed. I wonder, I wonder what's that reflecting about him? I don't know. I think he um, just doesn't like any animals being killed. Well, plenty of animals get killed when yeah. you're making vegetables and stuff. 
Exactly, when you're ploughing the ground. Ploughing the ground yeah. and cutting corn and all yeah. the little rabbits and stuff. I find no. that... Go on. No, right. no, go ahead. I was... J- See, death is a funny thing because death is so part of life. You can't have life without death. Mm. It's as normal as being born. It really is. And I don't understand why people are so awkward about death. Are you afraid of death? No. And I've had a couple of um, near-death experiences. Explain. Um, so I would, <laughs> this is going to get very dark. I'm really sorry. <laughs> but I, I would, I would have had suicidal tendencies growing up. And, um, there was a couple of times where I tried and to I was, kill yourself. yes. And I was not successful. Like I threw up everything or I would wake up in a puddle of, puddle of vomit and be like, oh, why couldn't I just. Was this it? at home? This would have been in college on my own. Now, there was one time where my friends realized and they had rushed me to hospital. And I tell you what, oh my goodness, like I felt so bad for wanting to die because that doctor ate me alive. It was like, why the fuck are you? Like, you think you're so cruel trying to kill yourself, blah, 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 blah. Like, made me feel like shit. And straight away, I just wanted to kill myself again. And I tried. And uh, it, just, it just all came back up. What, you it took an overdose? Hmm? Yeah. I took loads of overdoses. And did you have a near-death experience? I had... An, so my near-death experience was in Thailand when I was on a motorbike and um, I got hit by another motorbike. And so, like, I was flying off the motorbike. And as I was flying off, like, it was so weird. It was, like, time slowed down and I could, like, it was dark and I could look up at the sky. And the first thought that was going into my head was, like, I've had a really good life. I'm ready. You weren't scared? I wasn't scared. I was like, I've lived a good life. I can go. I'm ready. And then plonk. And like the back of my head hit the the tarmac. Now, I was very lucky. I had the helmet on me, a helmet on me. But then I landed and it was so underwhelming because I was like, I was so ready to die. (laughs) And now I'm just here lying on the side of the road looking like a fucking dick with a sore neck. And then, you know, I kind of like patted myself and I was like, yeah, I'm alive. All right. Okay. I, I suppose I'll just get up and <laughs> continue on. You didn't feel, oh God, thank God I'm alive. <laughs> Part of me was like, okay, thank God I'm alive. I can continue on. What's the next thing? But then also there was part of me that was like, oh, fuck. Because uh, I was like, I want, well, also the, I'm very curious by nature. I don't judge experiences as bad or good. Right. I try my best not to. Obviously I'm human and sometimes I do. But I try my best not to judge experiences as bad uh, or good. And I am curious about what's on the other side. You know, two things could happen, right? I could, th- nothing could happen. It'd just be like going to sleep and not waking up, right? And if that happens, then that happens. I, you know. Or something amazing could happen and you don't know. You could finally get all the answers to your, like, to everything that's what happened. What if one of those things is eternal damnation? <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe in that. What do, you, what do you believe? Or what would you like to believe happens? What would I like to believe happens? I like to believe that life is a game that we all play. Kind of like the Alan Watts. Mm. You know, like we're we come here to learn, we come here to play. Spiritual beings yeah. having a human experience. Exactly. Or we're the universe having a human experience. I'm kind of with that one. Yeah. You know, and I just kind of feel like people think I'm so woo woo when I think like this. But again, they're just thoughts. I don't actually know the answers. They are just thoughts. But I do believe in God. I do believe that there's something out there that I don't understand because there's so much stuff that's happened in my life where I'm like, I should be dead by now. But I keep being placed on this fucking path of life. And all these opportunities keep falling into my path that have positive consequences for other people and me. And there is a reason why I went through all of this crap in my life to come out the other side. It's almost like all of that stuff was a test and a rite of passage. Mm. So I could come out the other side and be like, hey, I passed the test. (laughs) What next? Come at me, like, (laughs) you know, that kind of a way. Did you ever have an experience that, oh, there is something. Did you ever have an experience that just changed everything? Yes. Yes, I did. That was, I can tell you the date, um, 4th of May, 
2020. Drugs? No, no drugs. You could see it as two different ways, you know. If you want to be all cognitive and, and clinical about it, you could be like, you had a psychological breakdown, right? But there was a moment on that day two years ago where I realized something happened in my head. I realized um, that my father um, was narcissistic. He was not who I thought he was. That completely changed my entire reality of the last 30 years of my life. Because I had always put him on a pedestal. I had always seen him as, you know, he could do no wrong. He always portrayed himself to be this victim and I always thought everybody was bad to him and that he was a victim and I was doing everything I could to be nice to him to be kind to him and then as I got older you know within the last few years I kind of was like he's really greedy with money he's actually not that nice towards people he actually complains a lot about people he never has my mother's back he's actually not that nice as a person but for some reason whatever was happening in my head I couldn't um, put the two pieces together because I was still seeing him with that child like he, he was still your do not he yes was still yeah you know and you know he was very insidious in that like he would go to church and he would appear to be like all saintly and this perfect person and he'd always say things like um you know I look out for you and, and, and your sister and your mother or all these sacrifices I do I do for you and he'd be seen giving money to the poor um praying you know all of these sort of superficial level nice stuff but deep down um he would be what you what people would call a covert narcissist so he would show you vulnerability he wouldn't be very grandiose but he would be manipulative like covertly is he a victim of his own childhood Yes, absolutely. Everybody is a victim of their own childhood and everyone, every child is at the mercy of their, their parents and their parents' mental health status, you know? And um, at that very moment when I realized that my father was, um, not to diagnose anyone, but very closely related to someone who was a covert narcissist, um, something happened in my chest. It felt like my heart exploded. Like there was this big boom, like this big overwhelm. And it all happened in my chest. And I was like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> like, holy shit. And then I realized it was never my fault. Nothing was ever my fault. And I started crying because I was like, I hated myself for so long for no reason. Nothing was ever my fault. And that was the biggest turning point in my life. And at that moment, I, I'm i going to sound like a crazy person, but that was when I was like, there is definitely something out there. God, like to me, God is definitely out there mm -hmm. because there is, I can't explain it. How can I explain the fact that I've been so protected? I've had such a crap childhood and I should be dead by now. All of the times I've tried to commit suicide, the times I've been in accidents, the times where I've been exposed to danger and exposed to dangerous people because I was not always in safe environments. I was around people who were bad. Who didn't have your best interests at heart. Exactly. And I was around a lot of those people growing up and when I was a very young age. And I've gotten away, you know. And the law of averages weren't with you. Yeah, pretty much. It's like I just... I don't know how else I could explain how I'm sitting here today and just how I've achieved so much. From that point as well, when my heart exploded, stuff happened in my life that I couldn't explain. I gained a lot of clarity in other areas. And then I realized, kind of like you, you take responsibility for yourself mm -hmm. and you're like, holy shit, um, you know, it, it's all me and I've got complete control of this. And it I gave changed, you the freedom. It gave me so much freedom, but... I changed jobs twice and I increased my financial gain like twice the amount. Um, and discarding the burden of 
financially supporting your family. Exactly. Yeah. And um, new people were coming into my life that really resonated with me and they had very similar mindsets to me. And I was also given the opportunity to help other people who had similar experiences to myself in that they have been abused in childhood. And then like other truths start coming out about other people telling me about their own experiences in their childhood and had, you know, just how they had been abused either emotionally, physically or sexually. And I had no idea. And I had might have known that person for years. And then finally they were able to tell me and talk to me about these things. And it was, I was just like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> what, what's going on with my life? How have I when, been? When you open up, people open up. Yeah, I think so. I think when you're not in your head so worried about saying the right or wrong thing and you just say whatever is coming out of your you mouth and in your head. You just have to speak the truth. You have to speak the truth. You have to be authentic. You have to be transparent. Mm. Those are huge values to me. Transparency, um, authenticity and truth. And the reason why they are so important to me is because I realized that the last 30 years of my life, you know, what my family, it was that reality was built on lies. My relationship with my father was built on lies. He was not the man who I thought he was. He was not the man who was who he was portraying himself to be to me. Be careful on the foundations that you build on. Exactly. So if yeah. you had to give any advice to young women out there. What would it be? Breathe. Just breathe. Just take a moment and breathe. You know, I think women are under so much pressure. Women are definitely lied to. We're told that we can have everything. You can have a career and a fantastic romantic relationship and have a social life and have a relationship with your in-laws and have a relationship with your own immediate family. And you can have the career and you can have the fancy house and you can do all the chores. And also you can go to go and do exercise and do your yoga poses in the morning. No, I'm sorry. You can't have it all. Pick something. Pick what is applicable to you. Pick what you want. You're not going to be able to have everything. If you think you can have this fantastic high value career where you're required to work 40, 50 hours a week and be there for your kids, I'm sorry to say it's not going to happen. My family, my mother, my father, they had the working all of the time, never at home, never actually got to have a relationship with me. You can't have everything. Pick something. It's an amazing story. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's an amazing story. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't really say if it's amazing or not because it's all that I know and it's just me. And I know that to some people out there, I'm going to sound like this absolute crazy fool. But all I can say is, well, look, it's my life experience. You know, and I can only go by my own experience. And I'm not finished. I'm still going to experiment. I'm still going to say yes to many opportunities. And again, I really, I don't care what anyone else thinks. Because again, whatever they think, it's a reflection on them, not a reflection on me. I know who I am. Do you think you'll ever get through to your family? And have some kind of connection? Um, I would love that. And I'm always going to be open to that opportunity. And I'll always, you know, when I'm ready, I'll always have that olive branch ready. And I, I hope that we could. But I'm not sure if they have the capacity to do that. Because I, I can only meet them as far as they've met themselves within. You know, and another thing about, you know, with narcissism and codependency and certain mental health disorders is their capacity for empathy is limited. You know, how can you feel for someone else when you're feeling this internal storm about yourself? You can't. And sometimes people can be crippled by shame and guilt for what they've done to other people. They can't go into that space because it would just, they would just break down. You know, I would never treat anybody like the way my parents treated me. Never. And I think if they were to realize 
the true extent of the impact, I, th- I think it would, it'd be really tough on them. And I don't know how they could, you know, make a U-turn from that if they could forgive themselves. I would love it if they could get to that space and forgive themselves and realize that they behaved in in that way in an attempt to self-soothe their own pain and because they weren't given the tools and resources within their childhood to become well-rounded people, you know? I heard a great question last Go night. On. I'm going to ask you. Go on. And it really boggled me for a few minutes. Would you, like, if you had a choice of living for eternity or dying right now, right this second, which one would you pick? I'd die. I wouldn't like to live forever. Because I think life comes in many different forms. If I was in the same form for all eternity, it would get so boring. You know, I would like to experience something different, even if that difference was nothing. It's a great answer. Really? Yeah. 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 What would you pick? I'd be the same. Would you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I, I couldn't stay alive forever and watch everyone that I've ever loved and will love all go while I stay. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. It'd just end up blending into a whole life of suffering. Yeah. Well, life is suffering. Mm. That's the thing. That's the Buddhist philosophy. Life is suffering. And, you know, Jordan Peterson says that as well. Yeah. But it's it's up to us to make it worth it. Worth it. Yeah. Fiona, I <laughs> genuinely wish you all the best. Thank you. And Thank I you. think you're a great role model for young women, all Thanks. women. And uh, yeah, I hope you come on again, have a chat. Well, if people want me back, I'm happy to come back and talk <laughs> more shite. <laughs> anyway, thanks a million everyone for listening and say goodbye, Fiona. Namaste, motherfuckers. <laughs> say goodbye <laughs> in Chinese. Oh, they just say goodbye the same way. Do they? Yeah, bye-bye. Do they? There's yeah. no word in your language for that no we just say bye 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 yeah cool well, goodbye everyone i'll see you next week